want to invite you to turn in it with me to Jeremiah chapter 32 and verses 39 to 41. And our theme today, and if you're using a pew Bible, you'll find that on page 416, 416. And our theme today is the fear of the Lord. We talked two weeks ago about God as Trinity, God as loving Trinity. Last week about Christ as tender Savior. And uh, this week we're asking the question, how do we relate to him? What is the nature of our relationship to the triune God who reveals himself to us in the merciful Savior, Jesus Christ? And the answer is this, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, that's the answer. And so since scripture is pretty broad in how it defines the fear of the Lord, we're going to be pretty broad too. Uh, But hopefully clear, nevertheless broad. And so Uh, I've got a lot to get through today, so I'm just going to go ahead and stop introducing, start reading, and uh, get going. So Jeremiah 32, verses 39 to 41. God says, Then I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. That last phrase, with all my heart and with all my soul, is beautiful, isn't it? Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. He cries a lot. He's an emotional guy. Uh, We think of these prophets as being these tough guys, um, We might think of them sometimes as UFC fighters. Jeremiah wasn't one of them. He was an emotional guy. And he has been describing the new covenant day in the previous chapter, the day when the Messiah is going to come and establish the new covenant that is an eternal one. And here he describes it further in what I think are striking, striking terms. You'll note in verse 39 that he says the first thing about it is that there's going to be a collective consciousness among the people of God in that day. Look at what he says there. One heart and one way that they may fear me forever. Under the old covenant, you had all the people of God, but a small remnant of people who were actually faithful. Isaiah 10 talks about this. It's a very small remnant of people who actually were faithful looking to the Lord, whereas they were all seed and offspring of Abraham. Only some of them were truly living the godly life. In the new covenant, everybody who's in the covenant by faith in Christ is going to have one heart, one way, and the fear of the Lord will characterize their spirits. That's why Jesus talks so much about oneness and unity in the Gospel of John, because this was the promise that they would have one heart uh, and one way. That word there for fear, uh, there in verse 39, that they may fear me forever, it's this word yare in Hebrew. And uh, it's a word that comes up no less than 337 times in the Old Testament. If you break that down, that's about nine times per book in the Old Testament on average. It's pretty remarkable. This is a theme that is very important throughout the Old Testament. And truly, it's the effect of regeneration, isn't it? When God rebirths somebody's heart to bring them to himself and give them godly desires. Because we don't incline our hearts to God, do we? We run from God. and We try to live apart from him. But God has the ability to reach out and pull people back. And what does he do? He puts the fear of him in their hearts. And as we'll see, it's a good fear. It's a good fear. Notice there in that verse also, for the good of them and their children after them. Don't think of the fear of the Lord in negative terms. It's for good for us and for our children. So this is the first thing we see about the fear of the Lord is that it's positive. It's for good. It's a positive thing uh, for us. Verse 40 is a little bit of a repetition. It sounds a lot like verse 39, uh, but uh, as uh, Calvin said in his commentary, and I think he's correct about this, the reason why this repeats a lot of what 39 said is because it highlights the grace of God to people like us who just so readily refuse to acknowledge the grace of God. It acknowledges the work that he's doing because we forget about the grace of God uh, so much here. And so look at the effect of it. He says, I will put my fear in their hearts, the end of the verse, so that they will not depart from me. 
This is the second part of the fear of the Lord. Whereas first we saw that it's positive, second it's positive because we are close to him in the fear of the Lord. To depart from him would mean that we were with him. But he says, I'm going to put my fear in them so that they don't depart from me, so that they stay with me and they stay close to my heart. One commentator said they're going to have an inflexible perseverance. They might have times where they fall away, but if they're truly the people of God, they'll come back. And many of you have non-believing relatives and children, perhaps, who are grown and they're out of the house and they don't know the Lord, and you are banking on this idea that if they truly did know the Lord at some point, that they will come back. If they don't come back, they didn't know the Lord. If they do come back, they did. And, um, and there's going to be this inflexible perseverance. So it's positive, the fear of the Lord is, and it's positive because we are close to him and close to his heart. Look in verse 41 there. We find there a little bit more of a picture about God's response or how God, if we can put it in this kind of anthropocentric way, how God feels about all of this. He says, I will rejoice over them to do them good. I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. I want to explain this concept of planting them in the land. We've got to keep this in light of the big picture of Scripture. So whereas in the Old Testament you've got this kind of Jerusalem-centered way of, of seeing things, by the time you get to the Old Testament, and even in the, or the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament prophets, you see that God's mission is beyond just Jerusalem and Israel. It's really for the entire world, isn't it? But what's going to happen is that salvation is going to be worked in the midst of Jerusalem, such that Jerusalem is going to become the source of salvation for the whole world. And what's it talking about? Jesus' work at the cross and his resurrection happened there in Jerusalem. And Zechariah promises that there's going to be the stream of healing and cleansing that's going to go out to all of the nations from Jerusalem. You know what it's talking about. It's talking about Jesus' death and the resurrection happening there and extending out to the world. So when we embrace Jesus, when we come to Christ, in essence, we are turning our attention in turning to him toward what happened in Jerusalem, toward what happened in the land. And in that sense, we're planted firmly in the land. We're planted firmly there. I think that this is confirmed by the fact that Hebrews 3 and 4 makes the point that whereas the people of God never found rest in the land in the Old Testament, Hebrews 3 says, we who believe have entered that rest. We who believe have entered, we who trust in Christ, what's happened to us? We've been planted in the land as we've been planted in Christ. That's why Jesus also says in Matthew 15, 12, every branch that doesn't, uh, that my father has not planted is going to be rooted up. So the father is planting people in his son, bringing people to his son, and they are looking to what happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago for their salvation. Look at what it says there about how he will rejoice over them to do them good. I love this. God is going to be happy to fulfill his eternal plan in drawing a people to himself. I couldn't help but think about when Jesus is baptized. And you remember that the a dove the Spirit of God like a dove comes down on him, and the voice from heaven says, this is my Son with whom I'm well, what? Pleased. He's, he's pleased with his Son. And so when we are in his Son, by faith in him, and we're spiritually united with Jesus, such that everything that he, everything that he earned by his righteous life becomes our inheritance, he's pleased with us as well. He's pleased with the Son, and he's pleased with us. And so this kind of fills out what Jeremiah says is the fear of the Lord. It's positive because we're close to him, and we're close to him in his Son, the Lord Jesus, who brings us to him. So we have here, Jeremiah is describing really just a deep and abiding joy in the triune God at realizing his purpose and drawing a people who are going to walk in true righteousness and holiness and receive every good gift that God has for them. That's why Ephesians 1.3 says that we have received every spiritual gift in the heavenly places as we've come to Christ. He just richly blesses us and takes care of us. 
And what's our attitude going to be in response? An attitude of positive fear. An attitude of positive fear. That's why it comes up there in verses 39 and 40. The fear of me in them forever. I'll put my fear in their hearts. I was looking at different Old Testament passages about the fear of God this past week. And uh, one of the most well-known is Psalm 111 verse 10 that says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And one commentator uh, commenting on that verse puts it like this. He says, the fear of the Lord is implicit obedience. Implicit obedience. That is to say, a readiness to follow God, whatever he says and whatever he does. Whatever he tells me to do, it's just assumed that I am going to have this default acceptance of what he says, and I'm going to follow him. Remember, I had a, a keychain years ago that said, uh, this is back when I was in like high school, I think. It said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And I thought that I was really righteous and pious because of it. Maybe you had one of these. Maybe you have one of these. If you do, I'm not telling you what to do as, as a pastor. This is a, this is a, a, a sort of a, a tertiary point. But I then heard years later, uh, the late R.C. Sproul say, you know what, you can really take out the middle clause. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It doesn't matter if you believe it. God says it, that settles it. I just remember thinking, take my keys off the keychain, throw that in the trash over there at the time when I heard it. Implicit obedience means whatever God says, that settles it. That's what the fear of the Lord is. There's this kind of readiness within me and within us. Clarity about what he said and readiness to obey it. Everybody says that they fear the Lord. If they, have a, if they believe in God, most people would say that they fear the Lord. But the question is, do you obey the Lord? That's the question. Do you scrutinize yourself for spiritual flies in the ointment, as it were, to find out are there areas of your life that you need to change, areas of your life where you need continued growth and grace and all of that. And if you do that, yeah, it's tough, yeah, it's hard, but Jesus is that much more glorious in his grace because then you begin to appreciate that he's there for you even in your weakness and in your sinfulness. But we have to be able to test ourselves. My morning reading this morning had me in 2 Corinthians 13 where it says, Test yourself to see if you're in the Lord. We've got to be testing ourselves all the time. So the picture here, I think, that Jeremiah is giving us, if I can kind of illustrate this, a child who's an orphan, uh, who, who isn't, doesn't have parents, and then a set of parents, mom and dad, come, and the first time that they see this child, they say, that's our son. And so they adopt him, and these parents, they are rich in both love and resources. They're going to have everything that the child would ever need growing up. But more importantly, they're rich in love. They're going to be fantastic parents, caring so deeply about the child's well-being. Um, he's going to have everything that he needs. But they require conformity to, his rule, to the parents' rules and respect for the fact that they're the parents. Well, you would think that the child should accept this and should consider that, well, look at, look at how much they've loved me and how much they've given to me. The rules must be for my good then. That's the picture. That's the picture of what it means to come to Christ. He adopts us. He brings us to himself. He puts his fear within us such that we respect him and have this implicit obedience to his word. And we know that since he's given us every good gift, things are going to be all right. Things are going to work out well for us, even better than we could ever imagine. That's the picture. That's the fear of the Lord. He draws me, and I enjoy him and obey him. And so let's just, let's just get cracking, as it were, in, uh, in living in this fellowship. So I've got a few more headings here this morning. Um, I want to talk for a little bit about, so I've talked about the fear of the Lord in Jeremiah. I want to kind of pan out and talk about the fear of the Lord in the Old Testament overall. And then we're going to see three applications. And then I'm going to close this morning with two uh, examples from Scripture. So fear the Lord in the Old Testament first. Secondly, application. And then thirdly, we're going to see uh, a couple of examples here. So the fear of the Lord in the Old Testament, what is it? Elsewhere in the Old Testament, what is the fear of the Lord? I would posit to you that it is equivalent to saving faith. When we talk about saving faith, we're talking about the fear of the Lord. 
Whereas the Old Testament talks about fear all the time, the New Testament talks about faith all the time, they're synonymous. So fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Old Testament, New Testament, without faith it is impossible to please him. Sounds very similar because they're saying the same thing. The fear of the Lord is equivalent to saving faith. It's another way of describing that attitude, that posture of belief in the Lord, um, where he's God, I'm not, he loves me and cares for me, I'm going to follow him. Secondly, we might note also in the Old Testament that the fear of the Lord results in blessing. Results in blessing. Psalm 145, verse 19, he fulfills the desire of all of those who fear him. Again, that's Psalm 145, 19. He fulfills the desire of all of those who fear him. So when we fear him, he's going to give us everything that we could ever imagine sooner or later, right? Most things that we want, we're going to get later, not sooner. But think about it as you walk with the Lord, you're going to receive everything that you ever need if you walk in the fear of the Lord. It results in blessing. But thirdly here, the fear of the Lord results from blessing as well. If you were, if you still have your pew Bible open, just turn your head a little bit from Jeremiah 32 to 33, verse 9, and what you would find in Jeremiah 33, 9, he's still talking about how he's going to bless the people and how he's going to be good to them in the new covenant, and he says at the end of the verse, Jeremiah 33, 9, they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide. For it, that is for the people of God. They'll fear and tremble at the goodness. I am going to so richly and deeply bless them that it's going to scare them. I'm going to be so good to them that they are going to tremble at my goodness. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Doesn't that recast how we think about the fear of the Lord a little bit? All I could think about when I read that this past week was, when Jesus is out there on the boat with the disciples, there's a big storm. The disciples think they're going to die, and what's Jesus doing? Taking a nap. So they wake him up. Jesus, save us, please. And so he saves them. He calms the storm. And you would expect celebration and peace and all of that kind of joy. How do they respond? They're terrified at what they've witnessed. They've received such a great blessing from him, and yet they're terrified because who is this that even the wind and the sea obeys him? That's going to be our response to the Lord for his goodness towards us. In the new covenant, as we come to him, we're going to receive such blessing that it's going to cause us to fear. You you experience this when you pray, and then within 15 minutes, you find some kind of weird way that that prayer has been answered. You ever been there? It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. When that happens, you're like, whoa, this is weird. And God would look at you and would say, why is that weird? You asked me. I'm answering your prayer. And it's like, yeah, but I didn't think that you actually would answer that prayer. That's why it's so weird. The fear of the Lord will result from his blessing on us. Fear is therefore a positive response to receiving from God. Fourthly here, so I don't uh, have you here for all of Mother's Day. Fourthly here, uh, the fear of the Lord is a delight, a delight. Nehemiah 111. Nehemiah is the great leader of the Old Testament, right? Anytime there's a leadership sermon series that comes up, Nehemiah is always the book that gets preached, right? Most people don't preach the last chapter of Nehemiah because it starts to get a little bit weird there, uh, honestly. But that's to show us that he's not the Messiah, right? Um, but Nehemiah 111, at the beginning of the book, when he's praying to God, he prays on behalf of those who delight to fear the Lord's name. He says, Father, or he says, God, I'm praying for those who delight to fear your name. That is to say that they enjoy God. They enjoy godliness. It's a joy to them to walk in the fear of the Lord. I experienced uh, something close to this the other night, and I'm going to get a little personal here, but um, kids are in bed, it's dark outside, and I'm going outside, I'm just sitting out there, and I'm praying to God. People who know me well know that I just go, I get into these moods sometimes that could be, that could be described as Spurgeon did, as uh, just moments of perfect wretchedness. Um, I'm down, I'm depressed, maybe anxious about things, not happy with how things are going, confused, and it just feels like the Lord is distant from me. 
And, uh, and I know that I'm the only person in this room who ever gets that way, I know. But, uh, but I'm out there and uh, I'm just I'm sitting under the stars. There were a couple of stars in the sky. There was a moment in the last few days where the skies broke just a little bit. Um, I'm sitting there and I'm praying to the Lord, Lord, I know that you're not far from me, but it feels like you are. Give me some kind of, some kind of evidence that you're with me. Minister to my heart, please. And as I'm praying this, I just begin to be burdened for people who I haven't prayed for in a long time, people who might be regarded as enemies. I say, Pastor, you have enemies? Not necessarily enemies, but people who I'm not on speaking terms with, sure. I think a lot of us do. I do. Unfortunately, it's sad. But what does Jesus say? Pray for your enemies. And so I'm sitting there, and I haven't prayed for these people for a while, because who wants to pray for their enemies? But, um, but I'm just in such a, such a moldable state of heart at that time that as I begin to cry out to the Lord for him to be near me, I just begin to be burdened for these people, and I begin to pray. And then it dawns on me a few minutes later, that's the answer to the prayer. That was the Lord in me praying for these people. It wasn't me. It was the Lord in me. And there was just such a sense of joy and delight that the Lord had drawn near and had gotten close. I think that's what Nehemiah means when he talks about delighting to fear the Lord. When he comes in, even if it's in the midst of, of pain and turmoil and, again, Spurgeon, perfect wretchedness, even if it's in the midst of that, there is this delight when the Lord draws near. Um, we indeed delight to fear the Lord. Last couple of uh, points here. The fear of the Lord in the Old Testament consists in right desires and right behaviors. Psalm 34, 11 to 14. By the way, if you ever want to memorize a whole psalm, I would recommend Psalm 34. It's wonderful. It's so good. But Psalm 34, verses 11 to 14, the psalmist says this, Come and listen to me, you who desire to know the fear of the Lord. So it's like, oh, what's the fear of the Lord? The psalmist is going to tell us right here. He says this, Who is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? So the fear of the Lord apparently is right desires. You want to live long, you want to prosper, like Star Trek said. You want things to go well, you want to live long. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The fear of the Lord is right desires and right behaviors, is what the psalmist tells us. Living by principle, even if other people don't understand it, for the sake of good in God's terms. Fear of the Lord consists in right desires and behaviors. And finally here, last thing I'm going to say uh, about uh, the fear of the Lord in the Old Testament the fear of the Lord is experienced close to God's heart. Experienced close to God's heart. We see this back in Jeremiah 32, 41. Again, as he's been talking about planting the fear of the Lord in their hearts in 39 and 40, and then in 41, with all my heart and with all my soul. Can I just say, I love it so much when God talks about his heart. It comes up multiple times, especially in the prophets, Jesus talks about his own heart in Matthew 11. I love it when he talks about his heart because it shows that he has one. He's not heartless. He's not mechanical. He's not a robot. He's a father. And when he talks about his heart, that's to endear us to him. I think that this is why when Jesus and the disciples are at the table at the Last Supper, John emphasizes in John, in, uh, John 13, the fact that to ask Jesus a question, you remember what he did? He leaned back and he was leaning into Jesus' bosom in a way that's weird for grown men. But it's not weird if you think of if John looks at Jesus like he's his father and he's his child. When my kids lean into me like that, I love it. Isn't it wonderful? And so John leans into Jesus' bosom and this is a picture of what it's like to live with God. He wants us to constantly be leaning into his heart because he receives us that way. And if you would experience the fear of the Lord, you've got to be close to his heart. God cannot be distant. You've got to have the sense of God's closeness if you would experience the fear of the Lord as we're talking about it this morning.
He's got to be close to you in order for you to have this sense of the fear of the Lord. So that being said, again, um, I've got three little application points here, and then I'm going to close with two examples from Scripture after that. Um, but three applications. One of them is this. Avoid sinful fear and pursue healthy fear. Avoid sinful fear and pursue healthy fear. I'm taking this from a book by Michael Reeves on the fear of the Lord. He's a British theologian. I'd really recommend uh, looking his uh, book up. Uh, we're going to be talking about it in the Sunday school class here. Well, at the rate that we're going, we're not going to get to that portion probably until the fall or something like that. But he talks in his book about how sinful fear is when we hear about God's holiness and righteousness and we are so afraid that we refuse to come to him because we don't think that we can. That's sinful. You might think that that's pious. It's sinful, actually. Right fear, healthy fear, is learning of his holiness and his righteousness and learning that because Christ is your mediator, you can come to him. So you run to him, and he promises to receive you. In other words, it's to say, I don't deserve God, I deserve hell. And instead of saying, therefore, I'm just going to live my life and, and uh, go my own way, instead saying, I deserve hell, but Jesus is the mediator who tells me I can come to the Father on his righteousness as a gift because he was punished for my sins. He took it gladly because he loved me and he cared for me. And he rose again so that he could ascend to heaven and mediate for me so that God, the holy God, who is far above all of my ways, I could know him and I can even have fellowship with him and enjoy life with him. Sinful fear says, no, I'm not. I'm unworthy, therefore I shouldn't come. Healthy fear says, I'm unworthy, but Jesus is worthy. And I can come through him. Secondly, secondly, beware of worldly anxiety. Beware of worldly anxiety. So many of our anxieties today, so many of the anxieties in the world today stem from a loss of the fear of God. And let's be honest, a lot of us struggle with anxiety. I get it. I do too. Just as much as the next person, I think. But we're afraid of social things that are happening. We're afraid of political upheaval. We're afraid for our health. We're afraid for our children. We're afraid for this. We're afraid for that. Just fear, fear, fear constantly. And by the way, the news stations thrive on this, don't they? If they can keep you afraid that you're on the wrong side and that you have an easy enemy on the other side, then they keep you angry and they're going to keep you watching. Now, I'm not saying just let's just circle the wagons and go build a commune out in the woods or something and never watch the news. In fact, please don't. Let's not do that. I, I try to pay attention to the news. I want to keep up with what's going on. But some of you all got to turn the news off a little bit because the world's discipling you to stay angry and fearful. And the Lord can be so distant from us, so distant from us, so far from us, at least that's what it feels like, where his promises are not programmatic for our lives. And we wonder why we can't witness to the world. It's because we don't have any more peace than the world has. And so God says, I'm not going to give you power to witness to the world. You're no different than they are. You just have a little bit of faith in me but not very much. And so unlearning this anxious way of thinking that, that is our default way of thinking is what happens when we come to Christ and we begin to learn sense. <laughs> we begin to learn how to be sensible people living in light of God's truth. We begin to face our fears, perhaps. Fears that we really need to face. You might say, Pastor, this all sounds great but there are certain things that I just simply cannot face. Let me just say this. If it's God's will for you to face a certain fear, not only can you, but you will face it. He is not going to let you escape it. Now, I'm not talking about like, oh, I got a fear of heights, so you better go out and skydive or something like that. Please don't. Skydiving's stupid. Um, I'm just kidding. Some of you probably like skydiving. That's fine. It's not a sin. But it might be. I don't know. It just seems, just seems, 
Just seems pointless, I don't know. So I have a fear of heights, I don't really care for, for being up in high places. God is not saying, you don't believe in me if you don't go skydiving, because it's not necessary. But if you need to have a hard conversation with your spouse about something that they're doing or something that you're doing, and you say, I can't face it because I'm afraid of what's going to happen, that's shirking your responsibility and letting worldly fear and worldly anxiety control you. And you need to repent. So we've got to learn to beware of worldly anxiety. And the last application here is this. As you grow in the fear of the Lord, your other fears will begin to be swallowed up. The fear of the Lord will begin to swallow up your other fears. Again, so much of our anxiety and so much of our fear stems from sort of a naturalistic way of thinking about the world around us and the world in us, where we think that there's no heart, there's no promise of good, and we assume that because bad things happen, they must happen to me as well. And so we're terrified. We live our lives in fear. And if God has any place in this, we sort of attach him to our understanding of nature and the world um, such that however bad we think the world is, that must be how God is. And I, I, let me, so for those who are listening, those who are listening uh, on the phone, I apologize for this, but it's sort, of like, it's sort of like, here's us on the right side from my perspective. Here's us. And then over on this side is nature, when, and I'm referring to the world as it is, the world as we experience it, how we receive things, and then God is on the other side. And so we think of God in terms of how we think of the world. And so if we think that the world is out to get us all the time, we're going to think that God is out to get us all the time too. It's no wonder we have such anxiety problems. How many of us default to this position? But, to, but what God demands of us as a Christian is to reverse the two on that side, such that nature goes on the outside and God goes on the inside. Now I'm thinking of the world in light of what I know about God. <clears throat> it's not that the world is not an ugly, mean place, but the world belongs to God. And what happens to me is what he wants to happen to me, and he's good and cares about me. Do you see how different of a perspective that is? It's an entirely different view. It's the Christian view. So that whatever happens to me is happening to me according to his good plans. I don't understand it all. I don't get it. He's not showing me all the answers, but I know that he's good. And so it can't be that what I'm going through right now is purposeless. There's got to be a good purpose to it because he... <laughs> He, he's not going to show me his love for me by dying on the cross for me and then just drag me through the spike-filled mud the rest of my life. And so there's got to be this change. This is what Paul means um, when he says in Ephesians 4 that we need to have our minds renewed. He's talking about reversing the world and God so that we think about the world through um, through our knowledge of God instead of God through our knowledge of the world. This doesn't mean that we are never going to have any fears or any anxieties or anything like that. But it does mean that I don't let my fears stop me from moving. I don't let them stop me from living my life. And the fear of the Lord in time is going to swallow up all of these fears. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It's going to happen if you walk with Jesus. So let me just give you two quick examples here out of the scripture. And I hope these are quick because I am running out of time. There are so many examples of, of faithful people um, who overcame their fears. We talked about Mary earlier. We could talk about David, Esther, Jesus, all these different heroes of the faith. Jesus himself, the author of our faith. But let me just give you two. One of them is Jacob. Jacob, this perfect example, I think, of learning the fear of the Lord. You might remember that he was a swindler early on in his life, kind of a jerk little brother, actually. Um, and he learned his hard lessons, didn't he? Over the course of time, he learned a lot of hard lessons. And eventually, when he's out alone one night, he's sleeping and God appears to him in a dream and he shows him this stairway to heaven. 
Maybe you remember this. And as he's witnessing the stairway to heaven, surely Led Zeppelin is playing in the background there in his dream. And uh, this, God's point in showing him this image is, I am building a way between heaven and earth, and you're a part of it, Jacob. So I'm with you, and I'm not going to leave you. And it's such a warm promise that Jacob receives. But you know how he responded when he woke up? That word, that word that we talked about earlier, fear. He was afraid at what he witnessed. And he said, surely this is the house of God. So he experienced God's presence. He's full of fear, but then he gets up and he gets on with his life. And it seems like Jeremiah's point in talking about the new covenant is that that is what's going to happen when people come to the Messiah. They're going to see that he's the stairway to heaven. He's the fulfillment of the promises. That's why Jesus quoted that in John chapter 1. He said that he's the stairway. They're going to learn that he's the stairway. They're going to receive the promise. And then they're going to live the rest of their lives in healthy fear. And you look at Jacob's life. Was it all ups or was it a lot of ups and downs? A lot of tough stuff that he went through. <clears throat> but by the time he got to Egypt and he met Pharaoh, you might remember that he says to Pharaoh, Every day of my life, God has been my shepherd. In fact, I think I'm misremembering this. He doesn't say that to Pharaoh. He says that to Joseph and his brothers. Every day of my life, God has been my shepherd. You know what that is? God got my attention with the promise. It filled me with fear, but I lived my life with these ups and downs, and God took me through all of them. That's what it's supposed to look like for us. Last example here, probably my favorite example would be the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he's talking about his call to ministry. And he says that we are all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us will. And he says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. That's why I minister, he says, is because we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We know the fear of the Lord. But if you were to read throughout 2 Corinthians, some people would say that Paul was a little bit neurotic, a little bit self-conscious of a person, and that he had a lot of maybe unhealthy anxiety. Some would say that. I don't, I don't agree with them, but, but many people would say that about Paul because he's constantly defending himself, talking about his anxieties, his fears, his times in the past when he's needed the Lord's comfort. Some would say that he's not a guy that should be listened to. But how did Paul live his life? Have you ever read the story of Paul's journey on the ship all the way up to Rome at the end of Acts? It's a remarkable account. It takes off, and he's a prisoner. He's, he's going to be on trial, and so he gets on this big ship as a prisoner, and they sail from the, uh, from the eastern side of the Mediterranean all the way over to Crete, and they're trying to sail around Crete to go up to Italy, but there's a huge storm that comes that causes them to drift all the way to the point where they're afraid they're going to run into the sandbars off the coast of North Africa. A major, major storm, such that in Acts 27, 19, Luke tells us that all hope of being saved had been abandoned. But God met with Paul in a dream, and he told him, I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to take care of all of these men. And so Paul goes out, and he talks to all the men on the boat, and he says, don't be afraid. It's going to be all right. God is going to get us to where we need to go. And that's exactly what happened. He took them all the way to Italy. And it's because of Paul's leadership that Paul was able to get the kind of house arrest that he got when he was in Rome, where he paid for it himself, and people could come and, and talk to him, and he could preach the gospel to people at any time that he wanted to. Prisoners aren't treated like that. But it's because of his leadership, and it's, it's because of his courage on that ship with those Roman leaders even, that he was able to get that ministry. Do you see what happened with this man? He might have been a man with fear, a man with worldly fear, perhaps. He called himself the chief of sinners. But he had faith in the fear. He didn't say, I'm not going to move myself until the fear subsides. He said, I'm going to continue to live my life, and the Lord is going to swallow up all of those fears in his perfect time. May the people of God follow that example. Let's pray. So Father, today, swallow up our fears 
and all of our anxieties with the fear of the Lord. May our fear of the Lord be a healthy fear as adopted children. And indeed, may we become adopted children by faith in Christ, if we're not. And so we pray all this in Christ's righteous name. Amen. I do want to invite you, uh, before we sing again,